welcome everybody and thank you so much for coming to this panel tonight um, for the fourth annual Modern Monetary Theory Conference. Um, we are here today to talk about public banking and local government uh, with our wonderful panelists um, who I will go ahead and introduce right now. Um, the format of this panel is going to be um, each panelist is going to give us uh, an around like 10 minutes presentation on a subject related to uh, public banking. And then we're gonna have a Q&A session. So if you think of questions while the panelists are talking, feel free to put your questions in the chat and I will be paying attention to that and I will ask them your questions going to the Q&A portion. Um, so I will introduce you to our panelists. So first up, we're going to have Dr. David Freund, Associate Professor of History at the University of Maryland College Park, and the author of the award-winning Colored Property, State Policy and White Racial Politics in Suburban America, and The Modern American Metropolis, a documentary reader. He's currently writing State Money, Financial Policy and Market Mythologies in American History, pieces of which appear in short essays at justmoney.org and the Metropole, and in a forthcoming chapter of The Elgar Companion to MMT, edited by Yiva Nersian, Ners sorry, Nersian and uh, L. Randall Ray. Um, Noah Kamoha is heading into his 3L year at Tulsa University College of Law. He's a member of the Osage Nation located in Osage County, Oklahoma, just outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma. His focus in school is federal Indian law and its overlap with other fields of law. His lecture will cover some basic information about tribal law, existing tribal banks, and his ongoing efforts to engage the Osage Nation in chartering a bank. Mike Lewis is a volunteer activist and policy researcher based in Austin, Texas. He most recently helped publish a paper with the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity on COVID-19 era inflation as a research assistant to Andres Bernal. And he's currently a research assistant to Bernal for an upcoming paper on MMT for state and local governance. Last month, when Austin City Council deliberated resolutions in support of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, Mike organized alongside others to an amendment enshrining the city's support for public banking, local complementary currencies, and public payment platforms. Michael Brennan currently works as the strategy coordinator at the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. Their grad school capstone project was a policy toolkit on public banks and public payment platforms, and they've since organized with grassroots public banking campaigns across the country. In particular, last year they worked with Public Bank Los Angeles to kind an institutional model for the L.A. Public Bank. In addition to their public banks and worker co-op work, Michael is an organizer in D.C. with the Democratic Socialists of America and a follower of the MMT Twitter world. Now, now that you have a uh, who's get started with Dr. Freund's presentation. Dr. Freund, go ahead whenever you're ready. Hi. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm very excited um, for this panel uh, and really grateful for being included um, because I've learned so much from the community that is promoting and creating political space for public banking institutions. Um, I do not work on the topic directly, rather I'm an historian of American banking and finance. And so for that reason, recognize the urgency of these efforts. So what I'm gonna introduce in very brief comments um, is a context, kind of a backstory that I think is essential to understanding this urgency and why public banking faces such passionate opposition um, from economists and the commercial banking industry. Um, in short, um, that opposition rests upon a fundamental mischaracterization of what banks do and the end of the relationship between government authority and money creation. So you can think of this as a story of about competing worldviews. Public banking advocate, advocates, like the folks you're going to meet here, um, acknowledge money's public origins and its productive nature. So they recognize that money is a creature of law and political struggle, and meanwhile, that money is a debt instrument. But critics insist incorrectly that money is simply a token that stands in for private wealth, and so that money can and must, should, must be insulated from politics and, and public authority. 
So the good news is that the skeptics are wrong. They don't have facts um, and history on their side. The bad news is that their narrative has long dominated scholarly and popular discussions of money and in turn totally impoverished um, public policy on this issue. Okay, the basics. Um, standard macroeconomics, financial pundits, think CNBC, um, and most of the general public, and, and for the record, most of the historians that I ask when I talk to them about this, <laughs> mischaracterize what um, commercial banks do and the money creation process. And they do this by accepting a couple of foundational orthodox myths about finance. The first myth concerns money's nature, kind of its identity, and banks' role in its circulation. Commercial banks do not, as the conventional wisdom insists, simply intermediate between savers and investors, and they never, never done this. Um, they do not gather up existing deposits from savers and then lend them out to borrowers who then put that money to, to a more productive, supposedly more productive use. This is the fractional reserve banking story rehearsed in virtually every standard textbook. Um, econo econ students learn that banks supposedly set aside a small portion of their deposits as reserves and lend out the remainder for payment, um, expecting repayment with interest. And meanwhile, this story rests upon an or the orthodox claim that money is, in the final analysis, just a very special kind of commodity, essentially a token that measures and stands in for goods and services deemed valuable by the market. So money supposedly trades like all other commodities, but it has the advantage of being able to stand in for the bulkier or more ephemeral kind, right? That's the that's the, the story. But neither claim is true, right? Instead, what banks do is lend by creating debt instruments. Money is a form of debt as point of issue. Um, and they do this, they, and these are debt instruments in the form of new deposits, which are essentially ledger entries. So for example, if a bank extends a $10,000 loan by registering a $10,000 deposit credit in the borrower's checking account, um, sorry, that's what a bank does. It extends a loan by registering a deposit um, in the borrower's checking account. So the loan is actually an IOU, it's basically a financial credit. The borrower just created out of thin air. And it's worth $10,000 because the bank promises to accept it or a similar, similarly created bank deposit it promises to accept it back in payment to meet the debt obligation. So in simplest terms, newly created money is a promise to accept that money back in payment. Um, and these promises then circulate widely, making up the lion's share of the circulating money supply. That was the first myth. The second myth uh, concerns a supposed division between the private realm of wealth creation and the public role in managing financial markets. Um, this one is really multi-layered. In the final analysis, it's totally incoherent, but uh, here's one way to think about it. Um, it holds that wealth, the, the wealth represented or captured by money, the money created by banks, has its origin solely in private sector activities. That wealth is only created by a private, non-governmental sector, or alternatively, when the state owns the productive capacity. So then currency issuing governments in this story provide sort of a toolkit, the monetary system, that allows for the orderly and efficient exchange of all this privately created wealth. So orthodoxy imagines money as measuring and storing privately generated assets and then tasks the currency issuer uh, with the narrow role of providing and managing a workable monetary instrument. And the implications of this are really important for our subject tonight. Because it means that monetary issue by a public authority is not, and by definition cannot be, wealth creating. Therefore, governments can only access wealth, again, outside of um, owning productive capacity or simply claiming others' wealth through coercion. They can only access wealth by collecting surplus revenues from the private sector through taxation. They have to tax private revenue. Again, not true. Uh, remember, money is credit. Commercial banks issue it as a promise contingent upon the ex expectation of value creation, say trading um, for goods or producing them. And it's issued, and here's where the, the public-private thing comes in, it's issued in the first instance by a public authority, in our case, the US government. It's issued against nothing more than a promise to accept it back in payment for obligations to the state. This is often called state money for short. Moreover, bank money, which is often called private money, is only created by institutions that are sanctioned with that given that power by that same state. So a public authority grants a private institution the right to issue 
a credit that can generate productive activity. In the real world, this is kind of the fundamental, like money is productive and anchored in public authority, right? So the clean orthodox divisions between public and private and between the financial and real sectors actually totally break down upon close examination. So the implications of this for our subject here tonight are really momentous. Think about it. Together, public money issuers, in this case, a sovereign state, well, we can talk about sovereign, sovereignty, sovereignty, um, and banks, with that privilege from the money, monetary issuer, they create the contracts that fuel ec economic activity. So if they lend to help someone, say, start a bakery or to finance affordable housing, then the economy will get a bakery and affordable housing. If they lend instead to finance the gentrification of neighborhoods or the purchase of existing financial assets by, and then inflating their prices, right, you get the picture. But standard macro recognizes neither money's credit identity and its functions, nor the anchor of its value in public authority. And so it erases any distinction between money issued directly by public authorities and money issued by a commercial bank. First one, public authorities could be federal spending, like U.S. Treasury spending, or it could be from a publicly owned institution that's chartered by the government to create bank money. So in the orthodox imagination, it's all just commodity-like tokens that just increase the money supply and let the real sector do its thing, either more or less efficiently. And this disconnect from monetary reality is the backdrop for debates over the proposals that you're going to be hearing about here today, um, as well as debates over sponsoring what I would say is a more appropriate progressive federal fiscal policy. Again, monetary issue, when money is spent wisely, is productive. And money's value, right, its power to contract for production, rests ultimately in the authority of the public entity that issues it, or that in turn sanctions its issue to other entities, like the public banks that you're gonna be hearing about here. Um, but by denying both of those principles, critics can issue these dire warnings that enhancing public power over banking will no do nothing but distort economic activity by disrupting banking's supposedly essential role in, facil in facilitating the most efficient and productive use of private assets, right? So orthodoxy portrays banking and wealth as uniquely private institutions, phenomena, whatever. Um, and the public role ideally is simply kind of regulatory, not constitutive of value itself. But in reality, commercial banks don't simply help the private sector finance and coordinate the private sector, I'm sorry, don't simply help the private sector finance and coordinate private sector activity that creates wealth. Again, that's the myth. Rather, money creation by commercial banks sets in motion. It literally makes possible production and wealth creation. And it does so only because of privileges granted to them by a public authority. So logically, it follows um, that by granting more public bodies those same rights and privileges, right, by affording entities like public banks that are focused on the public interest, the power to create new debt instruments. By doing that, public policy can direct more of the economy's resources and productive capacity to what we would consider a public purpose, to equitable, equitable distribution and to sustainable development. Conveniently, orthodoxy's vision of finance and its mechanisms erases that possibility from view. So that's the, like the kind of intellectual obstacle that we're facing here. As you're going to hear, um, the, I'm, I'm wrapping up right now, the political obstacles to creating public banking options are, and they have been for a long time, pretty profound. Despite that, folks on this panel and other advocates have made remarkable headway in recent years. It's really stunning. Um, so my, my point here is that the political resistance to their efforts, again, from bankers, economists, and pundits alike, is justified by a deeply entrenched conventional wisdom, which is just wrong. Right? Creating more publicly owned banks will hopefully educate the public about money's you know, real world identity and its mechanics and functions. And meanwhile, um, hopefully educating the public about that real world, world story can help build support for this political project. So I now, thank you, I now turn it over to the folks who are going to describe how, how these banks work and what they're doing to, um, to uh, make them happen.
Thank you very much. Thank you. I always learn an immense amount every time Dr. Freund talks in any way, shape or form. So much appreciated. Um, so I'm going to transfer permissions over to Noah. Um, so Noah Kamoha is next up. Um, Noah, if you uh, have trouble sharing your screen, let me know. Hey, hi there. I hope everybody's doing great. I'm uh, very grateful for being here today. Um, I'm wrapping up my 2L year in law school and I've got one more year left. My, I had three objectives going into law school and my, uh, my largest objective is to try and influence my tribe, the Osage tribe, to start a public bank. And most people, when they think about public banks, they only think of the Bank of North Dakota. And I'd like to uh, increase that conversation by adding in, we, we've actually got tr uh, several tribal banks in existence and every tribal bank, although they've been <laughs> chartered through the traditional route, so a state charter or a federal charter, on the back end, they operate as public banks because any profits you get from a tribal bank go back to the community, just like any other uh, public bank would operate. And in a few slides, I'm going to show you a map of existing tribal banks. But first, let's just talk about a little bit of uh, federal Indian law, just a quick overview. So uh, the courts have decided that tribal rights and tribal sovereignty exists not as uh, because they're a minority or, or a specific ethnicity or race, but they're actually inherited property rights. Those rights are based out of generally a, a geographical location combined with the, uh, the federal tribal status. And your geographical location, most people think of them as a, something like a reservation, but the, the statutory definition is, is uh, Indian country. And over time, we all know, you know, after the Indiana Purchase of 1803, heading west, invading Indian territory. They shrunk their ancestral territories, moved them onto reservations. A reservation was a communally owned centralized piece of land. The government further came in, applied a grid uh, that's called the allotment process to the reservations, divided up the reservations. It made it easier for them to sell off the land. So tribal lands have been continually diminished over time. Uh, but what exists still qualifies as Indian country. Through Indian country, um, we have a certain level of sovereignty. And it's not a complete sovereignty. It's debated our level of sovereignty. The courts call it a domestic dependent nation. We don't have the sovereignty of a foreign nation. Um, but because of our somewhat dependent status that the government has labeled us with, we developed a federal trust doctrine. And that trust relationship is kind of a double-edged sword because it protects us, it gives us opportunities, it gives us you know, various tax exemptions. We can do things like build casinos, we can develop our mineral rights. Um, but at the same time, we're, we're limited uh, by the trust doctrine, by the, the the domestic dependent label. So we're just like the federal system where states are in battle with the federal government for increased sovereignty and control over their <clears throat> municipalities and, and communities, tribes are also battling with state and federal governments to exert their control. And what states have, uh, tribes have begun doing is, as you can see by this slide, and this is available uh, on the Minneapolis website. It's interactive. You can click on any of these. You, you can look in the lower right corner and you can see these different types of monetary uh, institutions. There's about 15 full tribal banks. All but one are state chartered. There's one centered in Colorado. It's a combination of several tribes that came together and, and chartered a federal bank. Uh, so they're a member of the Federal Reserve. And what I'm working on is 
trying to get an Osage bank started. I'm not super concerned if we're federally chartered or state chartered because I have sort of a different vision for lending. I've begun talking to the, the current chief. We're in an election cycle. I'll be talking with all of the candidates for Congress and uh, president and vice president in, in June. And I hope to present to them my idea later this year if they're amiable to it. So my idea is a little bit different, my take on public banking. Uh, I think that, as Dr. Freund was mentioning, there is a lot of opposition to public banking. And I think that we can change the conversation and we should, you know, think about working on some slogans. And one of the slogans I like is pre-distribution, not redistribution. So pre-distribution, that is that if you follow the money, you're going to find corruption and you can fix that corruption to transparency. But what I think we really need to focus on is not following where the money goes, but following the money back to its origin. And that is what we find banks are doing. Banks create money through the fractional reserve lending process. So follow the money, but follow it back to its origin. That's pre-distribution. And when you take the power of pre-distribution, um, it looks like my slideshow is ending, but I think you guys got the picture. So when you look at the power of pre-distribution, um, I'm, I'm developing a, a new type of lending that I call mirror lending. And the idea is that we would have a network of public banks. I'm going to hopefully get the Osage Bank established, reach out to some other tribal banks. What you do is you'd ask your city, munis municipality, state, whatever public bank you have, to create a list of needs, price them out, get really organized. And one bank for one tribe or city would go to another public bank. And what we would do is we would say, I've got a $100,000 project, I've got a $10 million project, whatever size project you have. And I'd like for you to loan us the money for our project. And that city or that public bank is gonna look at their list and they're gonna say, okay, actually we have a couple of projects we can put together. We can match that $10 million loan and you loan each other, called mirror lending, it's a very simple concept. You loan each other into existence infrastructure. So instead of the traditional orthodox route where you're trying to accumulate all these accounts in order to take that money and create infrastructure with that money, what you would do is you'd look at your capital, you look at your budget, you decide how much you could spend and through this process of relationships, you directly create what you want for your infrastructure. And as your infrastructure builds, as your capital increases, then you're gonna create jobs. You're going to draw people into your communities. And this is important for tribes. We're, we're losing our communities. People come in, you might develop the minerals, like look at the Navajo Nation. They developed the ore for uranium and, and, and the, the waters are radioactive and then they just abandon it. And, and the, the people in the Navajo Nation don't have uh, adequate water supply. So we need to create infrastructure in these communities. Through the mirror lending process, you bypass the need to accumulate accounts. So you start by being able to max out whatever capital reserve you have in this relationship. And here's what happens. Two banks lending to each other. The first bank, they send off a payment to bank number two. Bank number two, so the first bank payment's due on the first. Bank number two, their payment's due on the 15th. They take that payment that you sent them, they send it back to you on the 15th. You take that payment, you send it back on the first. And the first person that sent the payment, they end up getting that very last payment. And so in essence, you've got two communities who have created some sort of infrastructure type loan, essentially at no cost. And you can repeat that process. And in the meantime, you've got small accounts accumulating on the side, the traditional orthodox method. And, and especially good is if, if, you're, if your infrastructure development through mirror lending can also create a source of revenue, then you add to your capital base, 
you add to those accumulating accounts. And the next time you go to get a mirror loan, you can get an even larger mirror loan. Some, some tribes and cities might have a pretty good capital base. And so if we get a network of these public banks together that are interested in mirror lending, then we could really uh, exert some change. And another cool thing about tribal lending, it's not a settled fact. All of the potential opportunities that reside in Indian country. What I'd really like to see is I'd like to see us developing infrastructure, creating things like giant internet server warehouses, real estate for the, the tech world. And if we can develop incentives and compete with foreign entities and bring jobs back to through public banking, I think that would be a great route. Um, and I'm going to do my best to keep in touch with you and let you know how it's going with Osage Tribe. I think we'd actually have a capacity to start pretty large. There's a couple of pretty big Indian banks out there that could start large. And um, we'll see how it goes. That's all I've got for you today. And I'll give it back to Ashley. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Noah. That was fascinating. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, if you come up with questions during these presentations, please do post them in the chat and I'll ask them during the Q&A session. Um, that, I will go ahead and toss it over to Mike Lewis um, and I will make you the presenter now. Um, so, Mike, if you have any trouble presenting, let me know. I'm going to go ahead and push out the uh, presentation to everybody. Thanks, everyone. Um... Happy Friday, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening. Um, today, I'm going to be previewing some of the core themes of a paper coming uh, soon um, that I'm working on as a research assistant for Andres Bernal, uh, who's here with us on the on the the, the call today. I know. Uh, thanks for being here, Andres. Um, and so, you know, a lot of folks to. Thank real quick, um, just uh, Fidel Kaboob and, and the GISP, and then uh, Rohan Gray and Nathan Tankus for helping form a lot of my research on this stuff. Um, really kind of looking at um, the, the status quo for, for local governance right now. Um, obviously, the federal government isn't really uh, doing you know, enough in terms of uh, especially climate change, a lot of uh, social needs. Um, you know uh, the the uh, the situation of you know being able to rely on federal money at the local level um, is something that's becoming more and more of a, a challenge. Um, you know, of course, the existing model for local governance across uh, the U.S. mostly is you know the the taxpayer uh, revenue model. Um, you know, first and foremost, to point out uh, taxpayer money is uh, a racist, sexist, and classist trope. Um, it's basically a dog whistle um, deeply rooted in white supremacy. You can see uh, Vanessa Williamson's piece on that in Descent Magazine, The Austerity Politics of White Supremacy, um, or Camille Walsh's book, Racial Taxation, um, which really gets into how property taxes to finance public schools um, is, a, is a tool of segregation and uh, structural racism. Racism. And so, you know, this the status quo that we have assumes that the funding that we get for uh, local governance comes from the taxpayer, even though governments, uh, even local governments finance uh, them, so their operating budgets through an array of streams, including, you know, federal transfer policies and mandates, um, uh, local taxing power is part of it, but there's also loans fees, fines, bonds, uh, tuition through local universities, uh, customs, levies, um, civil asset forfeiture, and the allocation of property rights. Um, Rohan Gray helped me understand uh, this sense that, you know, people experiencing homelessness pay for uh, a city and national policy by conceding their housing rights to uh, private property uh, design and resource allocation um, that prioritizes the wealthy uh, and their speculative real estate investments. So we have to be able to think beyond just uh, the cost and finite money terms um, and, and think you know, more holistically about how we perceive those, those costs. Um, 
and so you know the status quo of local governance is also heavily over dependent on on private investment you can see that in the race to the bottoms happening for uh, you know amazon hq2 um, tesla uh, is a good case study here in austin um, and so you know in terms of uh, where we're at here in austin i'll just point out um, this is from the city of austin's 2021-2022 uh, budget um, with the, the GOP imposed revenue caps at the local level, um, you know, our city manager is screaming out that we, we require a fundamental change in the way that we do business. So, you know, just with that point, uh, really want to drive home that this is where MMT does have things to add to the local governance conversation. Uh, Dr. Freund uh, uh, brilliantly pointed out how money is not just this neutral private thing, uh, uh, but it's it's actually uh, a positive sum, uh, especially when used wisely, to, to actually create uh, wealth. And so, um, yeah, in terms of um, what we're also seeing at the local level is the rise of the, the crypto mayor, um, different, you know, private money solutions that are coming in there because, uh, you know, they're obviously the, the existing status quo of relying on the private commercial banking sector um, hasn't been uh, so swell, you know, see the 2008 financial crisis. And also um, through COVID, uh, we saw that uh, reliance on private banks um, uh, did not outperform North Dakota's public bank. That's a really good case study right there. I know Michael will probably get into that. Um, and so with the, the paper, we're also going to uh, complement the idea of the currency issuer versus the currency user. Um, and so, you know, I know that we talked about, you know, the federal government is the, the currency issuer of the dollar. Um, I want to read real quick a, a, a quick thread from Scott, Professor Scott Ferguson. Um, Time to lovingly complicate MMT 101 to make MMT the best that it can be. Um, you know, we're talking about the distinction between federal government as a currency issuer in contrast to sub-federal governments, um, you know, which allegedly only are users of currency uh, recycling scarce funds. Um, as I, that's Scott, uh, and others have pointed out, elsewhere, um, see the uni proposal. Um, MMT's post-Keynesian theory of uh, endogenous money requires us to let go of models grounded in physics, which means uh, the logics of redistribution um, hold absolutely nowhere, including at the sub-federal levels. And, and he goes on to make the key point that basically, um, you know, money is uh, something that can be issued from the local level. Um, we can issue complementary currencies. Um, you know, uh, uh, this can be based on that that institution's role as an active legal agent uh, in the local community. So, you know, a local city has its role in uh, levying taxes fees and fines, um, utilities, um, the role of the local city in uh, issuing licenses to be a landlord, um, all of those types of roles uh, in the local community as an active legal agent um, give that institution capacity for issuing credits and debts. And that's something that's been silenced. Uh, there's a term monetary silencing. Check out the, the Money on the Left episode with Jacob Feinig on that. Um, you know, this is something that has that they've, they've kind of taken from us, uh, uh, the ability to have that issuance um, at, at local level institutions uh, and something that we need to claw back. Um, and so local governments, they can mobilize local resources to break out of that neoliberal taxpayer revenue status quo um, to open up new possibilities for care. Um, you know, there's this idea of a nested interdependence between the federal and the local. Um, you know, major capital expenditures at the local level through bonds, um, they're oftentimes uh, purchased from the private sector, but they can be purchased uh, from the federal level. Um, we know that cities uh, can and have gone bankrupt, uh, but this too is a, a policy choice uh, involving, uh, you, know, policy, you know, governance. So, you know, we, we witnessed at the beginning of COVID uh, the creation of the municipal liquidity facility, uh, which was the, the Federal Reserve, um, you know, for the first time opening up credit directly to um, state and local governments, albeit, albeit it was completely unnecessarily uh, prohibitive. 
Um, so it was something that local communities couldn't really take advantage of. Once again, that was a policy choice. Um, you know, the, the municipal liquidity facility was run by the person who ran the neoliberal austerity PROMISA program over uh, Puerto Rico's debt, for instance. That was a policy choice. Um, and so you've seen a lot of pushback on that at the local level with uh, um, uh, movements like Chicago's local bailout for the mini, um, as well as the city of Philadelphia. Um, back in March of 2021, they unanimously passed a resolution urging the Federal Reserve to provide uh, cities with 0% interest lines of credit. So, um, you know, as Dr. Freund point, pointed out in his uh, awesome piece in Washington Post, um, governments have been picking winners and losers all along. And I think that's a, a core theme um, that we try to touch on in the paper. Um, and so, yeah, when, when the federal government shirks its duties to uh, provide real full employment uh, and, and care, local governments can mobilize uh, the idle capacity for public purpose. Um, uh, an idea that Nathan Tankus pointed out is uh, that that's local cities power to issue um, uh, landlord licenses could require that in order to be a landlord, you have to be able to accept that local complementary currency uh, for payment for rent. Um, and so uh, a few examples that we talk about um, in the paper, kind of, at, at, you know, the different types of public money options that uh, local uh, communities have to, um, you know, kind of beef up their monetary resilience. Um, that's a term that's also a paper by Rohan Gray. Uh, definitely check it out. Um, but so with lo local complementary currencies, which we've talked about, um, this is where, you know, local governments can issue a local complementary currency for public purpose. Um, take, for instance, the city of Tenino, Washington. Um, you know, the, the mayor of that town, um, they, they actually used Tenino bucks, which were wooden uh, printed on uh, currency for, it was actually first used during the Great Depression, which was a period of, of rapid expansion of local complementary currencies. Um, and so during the beginning of COVID, the mayor of Tenino, Washington basically broke the printing press out of the local museum and started printing Tenino bucks to use for local stimulus. Um, and there's a really good interview of that uh, on Odd Lots, uh, the uh, Bloomberg Odd Lots podcast. So check that out. Um, and so, you know, the, the idea of swap lines also applies to local complementary currencies. Won't get too much into that, but basically the Fed definitely has the ability to step in and provide, you know, uh, stability to that local currency. Um, and, you know, when it comes to uh, some other examples, obviously the uni proposal is a really good one for universities. Um, there's the uh, SUNY Cortland block uni units, uh, unis, excuse me, um, which uh, you can you can look up Ben Wilson on that uh, subject. Um, and then the other big idea uh, for local governments, obviously, is public banking. Um, I know we've we've talked about that in a few different uh, places, and I'm going to leave a lot of this on public banking uh, for for Michael's presentation next. Uh, but I think something fascinating and and what uh, Noah pointed out is there's so much more than just uh, the the Bank of North Dakota. Um, there's over 900 public banks in the world, um, nearly 50 trillion assets held in public banks. So really, the U.S. is a bit of an outlier in that perspective. Um, there's things that can be won between no bank and bank. Um, you know, the Philly Public Financial Authority is a really good example of that. Um, in just a matter of a couple of years and a dedicated city council member, Derek Green, um, they were able to uh, uh, win um, a 15 to one vote uh, for the creation of the uh, Philadelphia Public Financial Authority. Um, and that uh, is going to uh, be, be there to issue letters of credit that will provide greater opportunities for uh, business cooperatives, for entrepreneurs of color, um, you know, really big for the black community in Philadelphia, you know, historically denied access to credit. Um, and so really the last thing I'll say about uh, public banking is that, you know, it's something that can be won with a few committed volunteers. You know, in Philly, they didn't have, um, you know, any big institutional donors. It was mostly a few volunteers making it happen. Um, and then also, you know, having um, uh, won over a solid champion on city council. That's really what it takes to make, make these kinds of changes. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, um, expanding interoperability of existing public infrastructure. Um, you know, there's existing uh, 
um, uh, uh, vehicles for expanding um, financial liquidity and and fiscal capacity for local governments. Um, you know, a local metro card is a really good example. Um, you know, in, in Hong Kong currently, they have the Octopus card, and you get that right when you get to the airport in Hong Kong, uh, but it also acts like a local debit card with local businesses. Um, and so, you know, if you're unbanked, underbanked, um, you can use that card for all purposes of public transit, but also for local businesses and to cover basic needs. Um, and that also creates creates uh, more liquidity for the local governance. So the, the good example on that is Starbucks gift cards. Um, you know, currently Starbucks has, I looked it up recently, it was somewhere around $1.75 billion sitting on gift cards. Um, and so if you make it a place where people want to store value, you know, that's receivable in coffee. Uh, but, you know, if you make, make uh, that the, Starbucks gets that massive pool of liquidity, uh, basically a zero interest free loan for Starbucks. So local communities can take advantage of that type of idea around expanding that interoperability for existing platforms like uh, their, their Metro card, their student card, uh, and those kinds of things. Um, uh, so that's uh, basically it from, from my side of things. Uh, I'll pass it over to uh, Michael Brennan. So yeah, thank you for having me everybody. Um, I really appreciate being able to be in conversation with our MT community here. I feel like just based on what other, some other folks have said, I want to kind of maybe trace through um, a little bit of my own trajectory on this um, because I do feel like, you know, some of the confusion that David was getting at at the beginning was kind of how I've also been navigating through this, right? So my um, introduction to public banking. Um, I also can't see any chats or anything right now, FYI. Um, but um, my introduction to this topic was when I was a worker owner at our worker cooperative at the University of Maryland College Park, and we were fighting pretty hard to try to save it against the university. And it was really a refinancing issue. We were trying to refinance our debt that we had to the university. Um, we were working with a cooperative loan fund, but really there was just not like a meaningful financial ecosystem to support us. Um, and that was right as I was starting grad school. And um, I kind of landed on the topic of public banks as a bigger solution, a policy solution to this question of how do we actually support worker cooperatives? And that is also part of a bigger political, economic, social uh, agenda and like what we want to do with worker cooperatives in a more democratic economy. And as I was doing that, you know, it was, an, it was a public policy degree and we were getting kind of a light economics education. And I think I was learning about public banks as I was trying to think about banking and about finance. And I really was trying to, I was getting maybe a more critical view, but still kind of eating a little bit of the assumptions of my macro class or um, the folks who maybe were leading public banking spaces. And um, I think, you know, it's it's been a little bit of a journey, I think, because I haven't been doing this for nearly as long as some of the other folks here. Um, but I just want to give that as kind of my, my context for where I'm at today in terms of thinking about public banking. Um, and how I arrived at this paper um, where the focus was on um, a governance proposal um, for a democratic public bank. Um, the background on the paper itself is I was working with the um, uh, group Public Bank Los Angeles, PBLA. Um, they invited me to help do this research project with them. Um, really, it's interesting to be at the point now where public banks are not at the point of if they're going to happen, but kind of how they're going to happen and towards what ends and how were they designed. And so this was trying to sh take a first shot at those types of questions. Um, so it's a little bit less so about kind of the theory of money stuff, I would say, um, and more so about the political questions underlying them or the towards what ends are we aiming these public banks. Um, those money questions are definitely relevant and like we need to think about them critically, including you know, when do we spend and when do we lend? Um, I think that's definitely a helpful reframe that MMT should continually kind of push forward. Um, but that being said, there I think there is a role for credit um, and there is a role for lending, um, especially um, as we think about the sequencing of this process and like, you know, where are we at today and where are we going to be in the next five to 10 years? And how can we build more democratic local institutions that people can be meaningfully a part of? Um, so um, yeah, over the process of this report, I interviewed about 30 folks um, in Los Angeles. There are various types of you know community stakeholders, people working in nonprofits, people working in 
city government, uh, people working in different advocacy groups, different volunteers, um, to try to generate what I was what, what I could gather as um, the uh, the mandates, the missions, and the programs of the bank, um, which I'll in a second. And then also, there's there's kind of two trees of things here. The first is um, what the bank does and for who, um, kind of these three buckets of things. And the other side of the tree, I would say, is the actual governance of it or how those decisions are made in terms of what the bank does and for who. But um, put forward a definition here um, of a democratic public bank as a, as a publicly owned bank that achieves economic, social, and ecological purposes through democratic multi-stakeholder governance. And I think this also gets at the point Noah was making earlier in terms of Bank of North Dakota is kind of um, pushed really hard as the touchstone of public banks and the public banking movement. And I think we do need to diverge from that model, both for um, reasons of you know theories of money, like we're talking about in terms of not replicating kind of a fractional reserve lending um, narrative or the way that maybe that it can get pushed forward without um, a more critical view, but also like towards what ends is the Bank of North Dakota actually aiming um, there's a few pieces in, in this paper where I talk about um, the different ways that, you know, it facilitates, it gave lines of credit to the um, to the the state police when they were cracking down on the Standing Rock protesters, or they created a loan fund um, that was capitalized by oil reserve uh, money from that the state was collecting, oil reserve tax funds that the state was collecting. And so it's not necessarily the best, we need to be able to think of it critically. And this kind of comes from Tom Marwa, who's a who's a pretty prominent global scholar on public banking, he has a really good article on that idea. But anyway, so this this is trying to set up a schema to think through a little bit more. What is the public bank for and for whom? Where it will have a set of mandates which are enshrined in law. All right. So what is the bank aiming to um, What are the missions that um, that are more concrete strategic objectives to achieve those mandates? And then what are the programs that the bank actually operationalizes those missions through? So I'll make that a little bit more specific here. These were the mandates um, that I had proposed in this paper for it. And just to give some, some texture to this idea, um, you know, so one of them here, I don't want to go through all of them, but if we're talking about, um, you know, uh, promoting equitable recoveries from crises, we can think about COVID, we can think about a natural disaster, um, if the bank is mandated to promote equitable recoveries, one of those missions could be to preserve the baseline amount of small businesses and jobs that there were prior to the crisis, right? That's like a specific strategic objective. If you're like leading an organization, that's kind of the way you would want to think about how you measure if you're achieving your mandate or not. And then the way it could is it could offer flexible near zero interest operational lines of credit um, to um, different types of small businesses in order for the purpose of preserving jobs, or you can attach strings to that. Um, you can finance the conversion of distressed businesses to Black, Indigenous, immigrant, worker-owned, or public ownership, or community ownership. Um, you can that, that would be on the program side, but if the mission was to preserve the baseline amount of small businesses. Um, you know, if another, another uh, objective here is to, oops, sorry, to, um, you know, address the climate crisis and the biodiversity crises, um, a mission there would be uh, achieving a carbon negative loan portfolio and um, an oper carbon negative operational footprint. So, you know, that could be pretty specific to like the physical footprint of like the building itself, um, but also um, making sure that um, across its, its loan portfolio, it's, it's carbon negative and actively um, yeah, decarbonizing the city, as well as addressing um, like local sites of environmental harm, environmental pollution, racism. Um, so that's just to give a little bit of texture. I don't want to dwell on it too hard given the time, but the, it's in the paper in terms of a little bit more of these specifics here. Um, and feel free to interrupt me if anything can't see or hear me or anything. Um, so getting into the governance side of the tree, I was spelling out. Um, this is something that I wanted to push the envelope on with so that we could think a little bit more openly about what is the possibilities of public banks, because there is kind of a rhetorical move people make of wanting to not feel like a bank is going to be threatening to people, right? Like maybe we do want to address climate change. Maybe we do want to address racism with the existing banking system by having public banks. Um, but there's kind of like, it's a banker's job at the end of the day. The banker's going to do the banker's thing. 
um, and the governance questions get kind of pushed to the side. So this is attempting to have a little bit more ambitious view of what the bank, how the bank could be governed and how those mandates, missions, and programs are set. So basically, the Los Angeles city government, the city council, they create the bank. Um, and then in the bank, there are pretty much four main areas that we could think of governance wise. We would have, um, you know, a board of commissioners. We could think of this like a normal corporate board or an organizational board. Um, they would chair different committees that would set policies of the bank. Um, and then the committees would agendize some proposals for an annual general assembly, which would be something I, something I'll describe in a second. Um, and then the board would represent the bank between those assemblies. Um, and then the staff of the bank itself would report to the board. So a general assembly um, would be an annual form. You could think of it like a stake, uh, yeah, a shareholders form for a typical bank. Um, although the way I propose here, it would be assembled would or would be composed of 99 members selected through sortition or a lottery process. Um, members would serve for two assemblies at a time, with maybe half rotating off every two years. Um, and they would review proposals that would be put forward by the bank's board and the committees. Um, the board of commissioners itself would have fiduciary responsibility for the bank. They would have nine commissioners. Five of them would be appointed by the General Assembly and then four directly by the city council. They would serve for five-year terms. They would meet quarterly to get reports from the committees and the senior managers. They would be responsible for generating the annual report and they would do hiring and firing of senior managers chairing the committees um, and monitoring the bank's operations as the fiduciary. Um, these, these committees, um, broken out into three types, would have five members each, which would include the, a board member, um, three appointees from the assembly, and then one bank employee or one bank staff member. Um, the mandate committees, so for each of those mandates I named, you know, maybe there would be seven, like I suggested, maybe there would be one or two. It depends on the, the political process. Um, they would each be responsible for um, monitoring how it's achieving that public purpose that it's mandated to achieve. An operational committee would oversee a different department within the bank. Um, and then special committees could be convened to look at different issues relevant to the bank's either mandates or operations. You know, maybe there's um, there's 2028 Olympics coming up and there's something that they have to convene a special committee to think about the bank's relationship to a given issue in Los Angeles um, or anywhere for if we're thinking more broadly. Um, and yeah, so th those just walking through those pieces of the governance um, and didn't want to take up too much time. I think that's that's probably how much I've got. Wow, thank you to all of the panelists. Um, this has just been so interesting. I um, I'm also happened to be in a reading group with Dr. Friend and Michael and seeing your all's work like on full display was like really excellent. Um, I appreciate all of the time that you all clearly put into this because these were fantastic presentations all. Um, let me just get us back to focusing on video so that we can see all of your faces. There we go. Um, so we have a lot of questions in the chat. I have just one question that I am going to skip the line to ask first uh, for the panelists. Um, so all of you uh, gave so many like really important uh, details about like functionally uh, how we would be able to make some of these projects work. Um, and I think that there's just such a dazzling array of possibilities here. I wanted to ask about a little bit more the political side of uh, making projects like this happen on the ground. Um, a lot of like examples of projects that actually have gone through public banks that have gone through local currencies um, were mentioned during all of your uh, presentations. Noah talked about uh, tribal banks that already exist. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, possibility of being able to organize for these things on a local level, as opposed to a lot of the like big federal policies that we talk about a lot, um, like a jobs guarantee where you kind of have to move the needle on a federal level, uh, the possibility of maybe like building up um, from the ground, from these movements that are happening in your local neighborhoods to make things like this happen. Um, so I don't want to go in any particular order. Just if anybody has thoughts, please speak up and not everybody has to speak on every question because um, we have a half hour and I know that we want to get to some of the questions in the chat too. One thing I would say is if you look at the tribal banking model, 
um, some of the tribes will get together and they'll pledge whatever amount of money they have to get the, the bank chartered. There's an issue with the initial startup costs. It's expensive to start a bank. You don't have to uh, purchase a Federal Reserve membership. You don't have to necessarily get FDIC insurance if you're not going to have deposits. So there's some ways to minimize the cost, but you have to get an attorney. you got to go through the process of chartering, either at a state level or federal. Federal advantage is you can have branches all over the place. Just go with your state. Just go with the state charter. Get as many people as you can to combine their resources, and you can just create a partnership, divide the percentage of ownership based on what you how you invest. That, that would be the best way to minimize costs that, that I can think of. Yeah, I can talk a little bit around the political side. I had a good conversation with Stan Shapiro. Uh, Michael introduced me. He helped run the, the campaign in Philadelphia for the um, uh, Philadelphia Public Bank campaign. You know, they just recently won the Philadelphia Public Financial Authority. Um, that really kicked off in terms of some grassroots activism, um, you know, some, some lobby days and virtual town halls and things like that in 2019. Um, and so, you know, obviously through COVID and all that, you know, up until March of this year uh, was what it took for them to win just the Philly Public Financial Authority. Like I said, um, you know, uh, delivering letters of credit, uh, um, you know, to basically influence uh, lending and credit, um, especially for black entrepreneurship um, in Philadelphia. You know, so that's that's like the first step they've won. And then they're, you know, a few years out from winning the actual bank charter. Um, so, like I said, there's there's steps that can be won between no bank uh, and bank. Um, would love to give a shout out to Jonathan Wilson, who wrote up a, a really solid uh, proposal for a local complementary currency in Austin. Um, you know, on that note, you know, getting it, it, it's a very regional specific, like a local complementary currency in Austin. Um, you know, getting that accepted at the local level is, is probably the key thing. And, you know, uh, Rowan always points out like a user, uh, a consumer, uh, you know, ease of use is, is, is a key. Consumer trust is really important on all that. Um, getting it accepted at the local level is going to require some political battles. Like in Austin, we would want a local complimentary accepted at the local grocery store chain, HEB. So they would be a political site of contestation there. Um, to, to win that over, for instance. Um, so there's the local governance, but then there's also local political actors that have, uh, you know, a stake in as well, um, where you'd, you'd want uh, to to contest that. So, yeah, um, there's a lot of other examples of uh, successful public bank um, movements that are happening all over the country. I mean, California is a really good example. Um, Michael uh, talked about that. Um, you know, New Mexico, uh, we, we saw that um, in the chat uh, from from uh, Bryce. Uh, New Jersey, I know, is working on uh, public banking. It's It's all over the country. If I could make just uh, one point on it, I, I think something that was really helpful with working with Mike on the, the Austin stuff over the past month was it, it made it very clear to me that um, I think what we can offer in terms of maybe the MMT community or maybe the broader kind of like, um, you know, lefty finance or however you want to put it, um, is really this public versus private frame, right? Because the cryptocurrency and blockchain municipalism is going to really come forward in an, in a way that um, yeah it's going to be place by place like Eric Adams or what's happening in Austin like there's there's it's going to be a pole of politics at the local level it's kind of emerging into one right now and I think our, our public finance perspective and like the critical perspective that like MMT would bring um, to clarify the the different we, we can make this a little bit more binary as like a political project, right? Saying like the public versus the private and like, what are what are the public options that we have for money at the local level, which I think Mike is getting at in terms of the complementary currencies, what Philly did in terms of pushing for open lines of credit from the Federal Reserve, right? Like there's different um, mechanisms that we can name as policy tools, but, and they also have to be tied to the political project itself, which, you know, to me as a socialist, like it's just gotta be like labor constituencies, tenants, like community defense organization, like all the stuff that we, that needs to be part of the power building. Like that's not outside of the, these questions as well. Um, 
So I, I just yeah, wanted all to these add. issues are so intersectional. Um, yeah. Yeah, gr green transition is a part of it. Social housing is a part of it. The local level. I mean, all these pieces to it. And one other thing I'd say on the, the political battle kind of messaging side of things, one one really good golden nugget I, I picked up from Stan in Philly was when a lot of the more nuanced and curveball questions came at them, they just said, look, we want to get the structure built in place. Look at North Dakota. They have $7 billion in assets under management. They are getting 17% return on investment, which is better than Goldman Sachs. If North Dakota GOP Republicans can do that, why can't Philly? That Appealing to that local pride and ability to have competent governance in public institutions is really important. Um, so I think that uh, Mike mentioned Bryce Jones uh, and Bryce has a question in the chat, so maybe we'll go to that next. Um, so Bryce's question is, I work with a think tank that has been trying to establish a state-owned public bank in New Mexico for over 10 years. Our predictive, predictive models suggest that a public bank will generate roughly 15% return on equity, yet org messaging has been focused on the community good the bank can do because it won't aim to maximize profits. How do you think these two positives can coexist in our fight without undermining the other? Um, Get it, Michael. Yeah, I mean, this is like, you know, one of the political questions, right? Is are, are public banks mandated for profit or are they mandated not for profit, right? And I think trying to quell political concerns of, um, you know, like different treasurers or kind of more people, the current custodians of public funds who are legislators or the media will kind of defer to and say, well, how does this, pu this public financial system work? And then they say, oh, well, the, um, you know, it won't generate a return. And so it's not sustained. And they kind of like are being a little tautological in terms of their argument, right? In terms of like, well, it doesn't work with the current system. And so it won't work, right? And I don't think like they should be mandated for profit, right? In terms of if it will generate a certain percent. Like, I think the more important piece is how public financial infrastructure, public financial institutions can serve as infrastructure for the development of communities, cities, um, and can achieve specific purposes through lending, right? Like, and it's not the entire equation, it's part of a bigger toolkit that we're gonna use to do to develop our cities. Um, and when you are extending credit out, you know, at interest and like doing that kind of actuarial work as a bank. Um, and um, I, I don't think the purpose of the interest that's being charged is to make a profit for the bank. And it's not, not the argument that we should be making to people. It's, um, you know, that there's the risk assessment involved with it. And that has been, I'm, I'm interested in learning more, honestly, David, I'd be interested in your perspective on like ways that we could think of like an, uh, an anti-racist lending or like a, in terms of that actuarial science, like how do we get more critical about the way that if they're, when we do have public bank administrators, people who are making lending decisions for public man, and they have the public mandate for these purposes, how do we do that in a way um, that, uh, yeah, like doesn't like when they are setting the interest rates for a specific loan that like doesn't stratify for all the different problems that banks currently deal with. I think it's a question I have, don't really have a great answer to, but it's, it feels very central to that. Uh, if nobody has more thoughts, David, do you have any thoughts on that or should I move on? I'm now unmuted. Hi, I'm thinking about my response and I'm a little, I'm, it's a me, I want to be measured. So let me think about it. <laughs> a lot of moving parts. Are, I think that's super important, really interesting because mon monetary issue, it's okay. Money can earn a return and not be destructive. Right. So it's, I think on one level that, you know, like if money is a contract, um, it can earn a return that is also like commu communally productive and even sustainable. And I think I think you're absolutely right, Michael. One of the, the hardest political I think about this today. One of the hardest political challenges here is to get folks to embrace public banking as as locally focused and and encouraging local and again um, equitable and sustainable uh, development. 
but to get them to to break out of the um, the fractional reserve model, right? Like, like Rebecca Mary Shaw wrote this really great book about folks who were doing anti uh, red um, um, the, after redlining kind of um, uh, organizing to promote local lending. And she discovered that people thought that the, the, there were these were people who, who people who were supporting the Community Development Development Act. And they assumed that if you lent your funds to a local bank, that those that money was literally being recirculated into the, in the economy. And so there's this really fundamental tension between getting folks on board with this. Um, and getting them beyond a lot of kind of basic orthodox mythologies about how money works. So that's why I'm sorry. I meant to not say that out loud because it wasn't coherent yet. And then I said it out loud. So sorry. Bye. I thought that was completely coherent. Very interesting mm. conversation. I'm glad all going to be recorded so I can go back and uh, listen to it again because I feel like some of the concepts are going over my head and some of them are going in one year and staying in and some of them are going in one year and going out the other. So this is great. Um, so the next question that we have is, I believe, um, yeah. So this one's specifically for Noah um, in giving a little bit more detail on how the existing tribal banks function. So th there are some pitfalls with, with banks and I think that's what we're trying to navigate here politically. If you're a tribe, there's two issues you're gonna have to navigate. Um, you don't want to take advantage of people through something like a payday loan scheme, um, but you also don't want to leverage. So the, the mere lending idea that I'm talking about is you, you, you just take out a loan like a traditional loan. You put down a minimum down payment, but the other guy puts down the exact same minimum down payment. So you get your money back as an entity decide how much liquidity you wanna put into your infrastructure mirror loan. But you're also gonna to have to put up collateral. And so as a tribe, you have, to, you have to make sure your relationships in this mirror lending process or whatever lending scheme you have, nobody's doing mirror lending. This will, I think is gonna be a thing in the future. Um, but as a tribe, you have to watch out for putting out collateral if you're getting loans. And if you're getting lo uh, giving loans, you have to watch out for taking advantage of susceptible sectors. Um, and they're all right now operating in the same way that Orthodox banks operate. They're just trying to get loans. They're competing in the open market. And, it's, and then what are they going to do with that money? They're going to take it and they're going to reinvest it in the community. And that's why I think public banks can operate in the reverse we can decide on the level of liquidity we want to, that we can, that we can, we can take that through the fractional reserve ratio process. Uh, we lend out our partner, partner bank, uh, matching funds, and they lend us 10 times the amount. And whatever money you have in your budget left over, your, your, your revolving city budget, you use that for administrative expenses. So now you've got a revolving liquidity fund through the fractional reserve ratio process that over and over again, as soon as I pay off my mirror, my first mirror loan, I can take out another mirror loan. And you just shop around in your network of mirror partners. And, you know, everything's on the up and up. Um, you know, everything's written out in contracts. We, we create a system based on trust because once you mess up the system, no one's going to trust you. And the, the neat thing about this, you could have two guys on the phone and you could play ping pong with this payment. You could pay it off rather quick. You pay, you, one guy sends the payment to the other bank. Say, hey, I sent it. He's like, all right. Process it. I don't know how long large scale payments take to process, but the moment it's processed, he can send that payment back. So if something you plan on paying off in 10 years, you might be able to pay off very quickly. Since that money is appropriated to a legitimate expense, you shouldn't have any problem with the regulatory authorities. And you can start the process again. So you just have a, a section of your budget set aside for this type of, of lending. And then you keep whatever, so it's gotta be extra. 
you have a bank, you're going to have to have something extra in your budget. Basically. And if you want to check out the existing tribal banks, go to the Minneapolis Federal Reserve website. That map you saw that I showed in the slide, that's there. If you have any other questions, please ask. Awesome. So I think the next question kind of gets at some of what we've all been talking about this whole time, but maybe ask it a little bit more directly. Um, what guarantees that the bank will operate through lending, et cetera, in the public interest? Michael, I mean, your governance side probably has this. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the point, right? Like we're creating public banks right now across the country, specifically in California, in Philadelphia, New Jersey, um, maybe Austin, right? There's different places where people are currently pushing for this and political choices are being made and it's not guaranteed that it's going to shake out in the way that we want it to shake out. And so it's kind of up to folks to engage and think about how do we get it to serve public purpose and not you know, private in, or like extend, like just re replicate like a neoliberal, like financial paradigm at the state and local level with just new actors involved, right? Like that's, how do we use this to break out of it is like kind of the critical question that trying to get at a little bit here, right? I'm, I'm an organizer trying to do my part, but like, I don't, I don't have necessarily all the answers. Um, and I think it's just, an, you know, a political thing where we think about the Philadelphia Public Financial Authority, it's not actually a bank yet. Like they're, the model that they're taking specifically is they are doing a non-bank financial institution. They're creating it to get operational. And then that entity is going to apply for a bank charter after the fact. That's why they're relying on letters of credit, which does lock in certain political values, right? It's, it's making certain norm choices when it's creating that strategy and that political process to get an entity operational over the course of a few years. That's then building out its administrative apparatus to be able to do that. Um, we can judge based like I'm in favor of things that like we can like assess and then like kind of move forward. Like, I think it's good that they're doing that. I think we're going to learn a lot through that experience. I think there's going to be a lot of problems involved um, that are going to be very informative for how people in other places do it and how they should change it in the future. Right. And it's going to be an ongoing power building, like political process of how we address it. Um, it's not going to come easy, I don't think. And it's similar in California. Right. Like this is also in in terms of like one of the main issues the California banks are trying to address or why it became an issue was the cannabis industry because they weren't able to access um, FDIC regulated banks um, because of uh, there, there was just like concerns about like the legality at the federal level in terms of cannabis. Um, and so the, um, the issue that uh, or public banks trying to address that issue, but then at the end of the day, when they passed the law, 2019, they still need to get FDIC insurance, the public banks that they've. So now they can't solve this cannabis problem. Um, there's like a take, like some of the activists think that it's like uh, FDIC insurance or equivalent is like the way they interpret that language in the law. And they're going to push for that interpretation when they're setting up their public banks and that this is like contested territory, right? Like there's interpretive space for these types of things. But, um, you know, like that. <laughs> My point in the paper is just to say that, like, yeah, it's not guaranteed to, to the question. Like, it's not guaranteed that these are going to be for public interest. And if we're going to build state and local MMT praxis or policy proposals, like, we have to engage with this question a little bit more critically and deeply, including with the constituencies of groups that are going to have the power to actually deliver this, which, again, are like labor organizations, tenant organizations, um, you know, other types of people that are going to be able to force politicians to do the right thing on the, on these questions. So that's my yeah my take on it. Law and can I ask, contestation. Michael, can I ask you a follow up on that? Are there discussions about writing requirements into the into these um, institutions' charters about their practices, about their investment activities? Well, that's kind of what I mean by this idea of like the mandates, the missions and the programs, right? Like what is it mandated for? And you can get, you know, more specific with it. Like I'm, you know, I think there's definitely ways that we could be creative in terms of proposing specific policies that prescribe specific, prescribe specific behavior. Um, I think that there's, you know, yeah, I, I would agree that. And I think people 
should be thinking about it more. I think when we're in like advocate mode, we tend to just be trying to convince the public kind of abstractly. Um, like we should have public banks. What's a public bank? Let's use the Bank of North Dakota to explain it. And then we're not like digging into those like juicier important questions like political trade-offs that are existing underneath that like high level advocacy stuff that kind of guides the public banking movement as it currently as i understand it or like we can get into the conversation sometimes on some zooms when we talk for a while right like it, it can get there but like it's it doesn't emerge immediately um and mm -hmm. i think it's important to kind of um yeah for you know and this is maybe a role mmt space is very academic or whatever like People who are smart should engage and like help drive the conversation in the right way. Cause I think otherwise, you know, the um the the assumptions that people don't even realize they're eating in terms of banking and finance, like are going to come out at some point in the process. And like that has to be addressed. And like people need to grab need people need to meet people on that terrain to like talk about it and work through it. So one thing I'd I'd add real quick is that I think the idea of um pre-distribution instead of redistribution is that you've got some sort of regulatory authority that has uh, governance and they're operating on a budget and traditionally that's done through redistribution. So the argument is you could potentially reduce the need for the tax base through pre-distribution. Pre and the capacity for abusing funds can come through taxation or banking. So if you've got a regulatory authority, and, and, and that's separate from maybe smaller, smaller public banks that you're talking about, but as far as a city goes or a government goes, the, pro, the, the uh, potential to abuse funds is there regardless of if they have a bank or not. Well, um, good point and actually related to another question in the chat. We've only got eight minutes left, so this might end up being the last one, depending, or we might be able to squeeze one more uh, in there, but let's start with this and see where we go. Um, so can you see public banking as a way to public projects versus direct federal funding? Um, it feels to me that direct federal funding would be better for public projects, parentheses, a thousand castaways. And I think this gets a little bit to the question uh, that you all brought up earlier, which was, do we use credit or do we just spend? And where is it appropriate to use credit? Where is it appropriate to use, uh, you know, fiscal power? So, yeah, we absolutely need federal investment in these key issues for sure. Um, you know, I think that that would be the goal of, of most MMTers that I know. Um, absent that bold federal investment, obviously we need options um, at the local level. Local governments are, you know, interdependent upon uh, federal government money. And, um, you know, at the same time, they, they have those abilities to issue um promises and and uh and credits and debts and things like that um in terms of you know investments in let's say social housing um there's some really good examples out there where uh local governments um like like montgomery county uh maryland um their housing opportunities commission is uh building out thousands of units of social housing through a very kind of innovative um uh, uh, financing structure, you know, bonding out about a three million dollar in revenue. Uh, I won't get too much of the details. Read Paul Williams and uh, on that uh, particular issue. But there's all sorts of different ways that local communities have uh, uh, abilities and and I'd say responsibilities to uh, public purpose for sure. Um, All right, unless anybody else has a response, maybe we can just do another question, fit one more in. Um, so, I think that Raul actually put an interesting question in the chat here. Uh, what about public debt collection? And that kind of sparked for me uh, the question, you know, if you're gonna be issuing something like mortgages from a public bank. Uh, maybe that's not what you would want a public bank to be issuing necessarily. Maybe you'd want it to be building something like social housing. But on this, like, 
you know, usual model for issuing a mortgage, if somebody misses their payments, the recourse is foreclosure. Uh, is that something that you want the public bank engaging in, uh, like, you know, initiating that legal action? What do, what do you all think about that? <laughs> I think it's a great question. Um, and I think that, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of, it's sparking for me just thoughts about like, how do we maybe build in, like if we want a non-punitive bank, right? Or a non-punitive financial system, you know, the role credit and interest currently plays in administering like a punitive society, right? Like, like that's the thing we're trying to get out of and we're trying to think our way through and get to a different world on the other side of that. It'd be interesting to think about the ways that like credit and like the generative side of it can be used in transformative, restorative ways, right? And thinking, yeah, just like, what is the connection with maybe like abolition and then like, the types of principles that we'd want to enshrine with it. So if someone's like unable to pay, there's an individual lender or like a yeah, mortgage or something that someone's unable to pay, um, what is the role that we can play in making sure that they're getting what they need? If that if that's like the, if, and that's why it's like, it, it shouldn't even come down, like that we should be thinking about the broader questions at that point, right? Like if we're talking about housing as a human right or like education as a right, like if we've gotten to the point of like, um, debt collection or maybe those types of things. Like, I think it's it's just, it's still a bigger political problem that we have to grapple with. Um, that, yeah, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, it's it's a good question that it, for me, like banks, like they, there's a lot to unpack in terms of, yeah, like the role of like the actuarial science and like the actual administration of these things that we have to get to the point of when we, when we do create public banks and they are doing things like public debt collection, um, being able to have the space to be critical of it and improve it over time and like fight on that terrain. Um, I don't think that it's going to be some simple like bylaw answer inside of the bank in terms of this is how we deal with the thing. Like, I think they're going to have to be created and like, you know, I I'm unsure, I guess, the political economy, like trajectory of that, like what kind of institution gets built and then how does it kind of spread and replicate? Like, is there things we just shouldn't do from the start? Like, I know this is a point I learned from you, Raul, like in terms of like, some data just should never exist in the first place, right? Is there just some debt and credit that should just never exist in the first place? Because it's just like a category error of how we need to think of this. Like it's definitely something we got to work through with this. Um, so if there is types of debt collections that like we should never just even put on anyone, then yeah, like we should we should say that and like fight to make sure that that ever happens when we're when we're pushing for new forms of public financing. Um, so a little off the cuff, but it's a good question. So one idea I had about public banks, I think that especially if it's if it's being operated by a, a tribe or a government, and including the list of things that we have that we need for our infrastructure, you'd have a, a business professional, you'd have a maybe even a sector of your government that looks around the community, they know the terrain and they know what the community needs. You kind of set people up for success ahead of time. You know what jobs are available. You have to do the normal credit evaluations. Um, but we're talking about creating new infrastructure and creating kind of at the same time we're loaning out. You don't want to just loan out money with for people that don't have opportunities. So, so the infrastructure idea is let's give them some opportunities. And with that, you can have a professional opinion that's going to kind of help guide you with your business along the way, or it's gonna help you budget your finances so that you can make your mortgage payments. Having some sort of social welfare that, that's gonna help ensure the bank uh, and you don't become insolvent or default. That, that's one idea I have. Awesome, okay, on that note, I think I'm going to ask each panelist to give a really quick and dirty 30 second uh, closing. If you all are comfortable with that, it doesn't have to be like a total closing. It can just be a quick thank you, or it can just be like a final thought, whatever you think, but like 30 seconds each, just tell us what's on your mind and then we'll close out after that. Uh, why don't we just go ahead and go in the order that uh, that you spoke? So David, you be first. I have no time to prepare this. Okay. 
Um, the first, thanks to everyone here. Again, I learned so much from these conversations um, and I appreciate all the, the deep dive into the, um, the mechanics and the technical part of that. I've been thinking a lot about the actuarial questions that Michael's been raising. I wrote this book about the way that federally sanctioned lending basically created a, a racially segregated housing market, right? So, I've been, so this question of the local versus national versus the local public banking versus the national kind of fiscal solutions and national banking policy, I'll throw this out here as my final my comment. Ideally, and I don't know how we get there, I'd like everyone to understand that both federal spending and a and lending by a by a um a local publicly minded um banking institution is generative it actually creates it's it's it's, it's a productive part it's like essential to the wealth creating process i would love to see that be part of the conversation and actually part of the way that we market uh, you know local banking and uh, what would be a sound sustainable fiscal policy we're a long way from that and i'm not and i don't have an easy solution how to get there but I'll just leave it. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, uh, Noah. You're up next. Yeah. So, um, in closing, uh, I think this kind of discourse is great. I really appreciate having been invited, hearing the different insights and where everybody's coming from, and I think that it's great to have questions that 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 challenge. Um, but also, like, this is a very hopeful vision that we're all sharing. And um, I think finding a, a way to make this a message that's inclusive to everybody, it doesn't matter what your political agenda is, this is going to be good for everybody. And um, really, through cooperative efforts, we're going to make this happen. So uh, thanks again for letting me talk, and I'll be keeping in touch. Thrilled to have you, Noah. Go ahead, Mike. Awesome. Hey, thanks everyone. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to chat. Um, I think the key thing I'd love to close out talking about is just, you know, I think we're here in this moment where um, local governments, um, uh, there's, there's a, a status quo that's been around for years that needs to change. There's um, there's obviously massive disappointment in the the private commercial banking system um, and and the backlash from that that we've seen is offering one particular vision um, you know kind of uh, a, a private money system um, you know a lot of the folks in this chat are probably critical of of the 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 uh, crypto industry and so what what they're really getting at though is is kind of a, a desire for uh, some type of privacy-minded technology that's a, a good means of payment, good store of value. Um, and I think that we can really prove that uh, public infrastructure is capable of doing those things with public purpose in mind. And I think that uh, I'm really excited to be a part of, you know, actually creating that uh, with you. Happy Friday, all. Happy Friday. <laughs> Go ahead, Michael. Sure. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. I appreciate folks spending time on a Friday night um, thinking about these questions together. Y'all are great. Um, yeah, and I, you know, like I said at the beginning, I think these are like questions that I think we're all actively learning and thinking through that, you know, I still feel <laughs> relatively new to even like trying to, you know, some of these questions that um, we really got to sort through and get some answers to to be able to move them forward. Um, so I hope this was helpful for folks. Um, and yeah, and I'm thinking also just something that didn't come up was the, the Public Banking Act from Ocasio-Cortez and Tlaib's office um, that uh, Raul and Rowan had helped uh, draft that I think really gets around, like, I think we're asking a lot of questions that's like, if, this, if the federal government does nothing in terms of changing banking laws so that we actually have a framework for creating local public banks, um, that, that bill would solve this problem. It would actually create a whole bunch of room for us to navigate. Um, like being able to create public banks like and that <laughs> is very informed by like the mmt analysis of like you know the um like what the role of the federal government like we're really trying to like fit a fit around or fit a square through a round hole with some of the stuff we're talking about here which you know that's the terrain we're operating on and that's just kind of politics right now and like um but just just to say like i think that's worth mentioning that like even beyond just like the we should spend federally or lend locally like there there are other ways that we should be doing like federal banking reform that would 
really opened up and even getting to David's point at the very beginning of like deconstructing the private versus public dynamic of like public banks versus private banks. It's like if the public is constitutive of all banks, then like all banks are somewhat public already. And how do we change even just the understanding of banking in the first place so that our whole banking system is a public banking system in the way that it already is, but in the way that towards the ends that we want it towards in a democratic sense and like for public purposes that we can organize around and push towards. So I think that's, you know, maybe a horizon point that we can all kind of share. And I'll close with that. Boom. Uh, that was great. This whole panel has been great. The creativity is like off the charts. Um, I hope that you all continue to collaborate with each other and with all of the other like wonderfully creative people that you all have mentioned throughout this panel. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists for coming. This has really been inspiring for me. I hope it has been for the audience. Um, and thank you to everybody who came out on this Friday night to hang out with us and talk about public banking and local governance. Um, the recording will be posted to YouTube after the whole conference is over and we have a little bit of time to edit. So if there's anything that you missed, you can go back and watch it again. Um, and again, just thank you so much to everybody for coming out. I really, really appreciate it.